strikes in the night when the excursion steamer Neuronic, packed with sleeping passengers, is destroyed by fire at a Toronto, Canada pier. A few hours of horror, and then all that is left is a gutted, smoking hulk, consumed by flames which have trapped people below decks, in their cabins, or forced many of them to leap into the water. Most of the doomed passengers were from Cleveland and Detroit. 189 perish, with many missing and few identified. The survivor is still unnerved. I just wish that all the mothers who were on the boat with their children could be as fortunate as I am. The first outstanding victory in the Cold War between East and West is the end of the 10-month blockade of Berlin. Charlottenburg Station is again linked with Western Germany as trains begin to roll into the once isolated city. The steady stream of trucks start the movement of supplies, and though the magnificent American and British airlift had fed Berliners, they are no longer on short rations. Determined countermeasures force Russia to ease a dangerous situation. Lucky Lady, an Army B-50 bomber, takes off from Fort Worth, Texas on a super-secret mission. Only the 14 men aboard and a few top Army men in Washington know that its planned performance is to remind potential enemies of America's might in the air. Iran in Saudi Arabia and the Philippines are two of four American bases that send aloft a B-29 flying tanker to refuel the globe-circling bomber. The two pilots talk each other into position and the gas begins to flow. Hawaii sends more gas aloft and soon Lucky Lady is due at home. Mission almost accomplished, Fort Worth is alerted, and here she comes. A 94-hour non-stop flight and a superb feat by her commander, pilot James Gallagher. With the Red Army conquering China, fear-ridden Shanghai crowds see nationalist soldiers vent their fury upon suspected communist sympathizers who are executed in the streets with little ceremony. In a mood verging on panic, a crowd of 100,000 battled police to witness the executions as stark terror stalks the city. The end of all chance of democratic freedom approaches. The Red Army is at the gates. Communist shore batteries trap the British cruiser London in the Yangtze. 44 men are lost before she escapes to Shanghai badly battered. Americans and British leave by every means possible. Some have to be carried aboard trains as the traditional open door in China is slammed shut. With a flat ultimatum from Red authorities, civil and military contingents depart to avoid clashes that could spark a third world war. Nuns who have spent their lives in religious teaching know that communism will not tolerate them. Shanghai becomes another Red outpost. Philadelphia plays host to the 31st National Convention of the American Legion, led in parade by regular army men honoring the victorious veterans of two world wars. The youngest drum majorette is an attraction, and though it's summer, Santa Claus comes from Indiana. A Minnesota post is costumed colorfully in a spectacle of more than 60,000 men and women marchers. Fifty thousand of Rome's school children throng the Piazza San Pietro in Vatican City to greet Pope Pius on the 50th anniversary of his priesthood. His Holiness is touched by their devotion and declares that it is among the children of today that his hopes lie for a world that will not destroy itself. Lester Pearson, Canada's minister, signs. Robert Schumann, French foreign minister, joins his country with democratic nations. 
Ernest Bevan of England signs the agreement to aid any signatory nation attacked by an aggressor. United States Secretary of State Dean Acheson signs and President Truman keynotes our nation's reason for the historic pact. The treaty we are signing here today is evidence of the path they will follow. If there is anything certain today, if there is anything inevitable in the future, it is the will of the people of the world for freedom and for peace. Later, the president signs the bill providing funds for military aid to Atlantic Pact nations. The crew of a rescue plane looks down in horror on scenes of devastation in Ecuador as violent earth shocks continue. Frightened people run aimlessly about, others numb by terror, simply stand bewildered and helpless. 6,000 people perish, 25,000 are injured, 100,000 are homeless. In this ancient church, a priest was officiating at a children's mass, and now its granite walls are all but leveled. A grim search for injured is started as soon as nature's fury has abated, but it's difficult to evacuate hospital cases. Roads are blocked, rivers are swollen, all forces seem bent upon heaping an agony of suffering upon those already sorely afflicted. Practically the entire Western Hemisphere rallies to the help of Ecuador, many times shapen by quakes, but rarely suffering such ruin, horror, and grief. Suddenly erupting, one of the few active volcanoes of North America puts on a spectacular display that terrifies the people of this section of Mexico. Mount Paracutin sends up nature's fiery warning that beneath the Earth's surface there may still gather the forces for destruction to dwarf anything conceived by man. Only four years ago, this volcano wiped out a village and changed a fertile valley into a wasteland. Now a daring cameraman makes these films until heat drives him back and the volcano continues pouring forth molten rock from a witch's cauldron. There goes the flag, signal for the start of the 500 mile Memorial Day race at Indianapolis. 175,000 spectators see thrill after thrill as daredevil race drivers lose control of cars driven at breakneck speed and are out of the running. Here's a driver leading on the 24th lap when he loses a wheel and the car bursts into flames as it crashes the wall near horrified spectators. Other drivers dare not race through the wall of fire with possible wreckage beyond it. And here's Bill Holland who finished second in 47 and 48. He's gonna get the winner's flag at last as he flashes to victory.